Yes, guys. So what have we covered in yesterday's session regarding India's 32, 109 and 107? Now, these standards were relating to financial instruments. I started with the aspect of India's 32, where I started discussing number one, what is the definition of the standard, right? What is the definition of financial instruments? What is the definition of financial assets, financial liabilities and equity instruments? Then I went to the aspect of the differentiation between an equity instrument and a financial liability. Then thirdly, we get into the concept of the compound financial instruments where I explained you the concept of split accounting. Immediately after these three, we also saw the concept of exclusions from financial liabilities. Certain instruments which should never be classified as financial liabilities, they are puttable financial instruments and those financial liabilities which are only repayable at the time of liquidation of the company. What are puttable financial instruments? Where the holder has a right to demand, sorry, where the issuer has a right to redeem the uh, to redeem the instrument at his wish. So issuer, that is the company who is issuing the instrument, if he has a right to redeem the instrument, then they are called as puttable financial instrument. And also such instruments which are only redeemed at the time of liquidation of the enterprise. There is no maturity date for them. They should never be classified as financial liabilities. They should be called as equity instruments only. Clear? That was the aspect that we have covered and we put a full stop to India's 32 until there. And we came into India's 109 where we discussed about classification. What did I say? Your financial assets should be predominantly classified into three categories. Your amortized cost, fair value through other comprehensive income and fair value through p and AC, FETOCI, FETPL. While your financial liabilities should only be classified into two types, FETPL and amortized cost. For this purpose of classification, we have applied two types of tests. One is called as instrument level testing. The other one was called as entity level testing. Your instrument level testing was called as contractual cash flow test, where you check whether the instrument gives or derives cash flows predominantly from principal and interest. That was solely from payment of principal and interest. That is your CCF case, CCFC test, where you check whether the instrument is providing cash flow solely from payment of principal and interest. That is called as SPPI. Next one. Under entity level testing, we have applied a business model test to understand the intention of the enterprise to derive benefit from a financial asset. If the enterprise wants to derive uh, a benefit from financial asset, by holding it until maturity or to hold it for a certain period of time and then subsequently sell it or with an intention to trade. These were predominantly the things that we have discussed as per two levels of testing, instrument level test and entity level test. Based on these two tests, we have identified that financial assets can be broadly categorized into three parts that is amortized cost, FETOCI and FETPL. Clear? Until here we have seen and we've also come across the concept of reclassification. Wherever there is a reclassification, it is always because of a change in the business model. An instrument's intent, the instrument's basic characters under instrument level testing, that is contractual cash flow test, will never change. It is what changes is the entity's intention to hold that instrument. Whenever there is a change, there can be a reclassification. Whenever there is a reclassification, such financial instruments should always be measured at its fair value and whenever you have a difference between the fair value it should be either transferred to p and l or it should be either transferred to oca and then we went into measurement of financial asset based on their classification whenever i have amortized cost or fetpl or fetoci initial measurement was always at fair value subsequent measurement for amortized cost it should be on balance sheet date at amortized cost using effective interest rate. But for the other two financial assets, FETPL or FETOCI, my subsequent measurement on balance sheet date should always be at fair value. The difference in fair value, if the instrument is classified as FETOCI, the difference in fair value should be transferred to OCI, other comprehensive income. But if a financial asset is classified as FETPL, then the difference in fair value should be transferred to p &L account. We have seen until here and then we get into the para 5.5 which is the most important paragraph where I discussed about your impairment to financial asset. 
under impairment to financial i said we discussed about a concept called as expected credit loss and i said your impairment to financial asset is not limited to bad debts or a provision for bad debts your expected credit loss is a significantly better interpretation of your bad debts because here is not just talking about bad debts he is talking about the delay in receiving the money from the day it falls due the difference between these two dates in determining expected credit loss was called as probability of default probability of default is equal to the number of days of difference between the date it falls due minus the day on which the payment is actually received so based on which we calculated what is the expected credit loss or impairment of financial asset now the same things we are looking at financial instruments definition financial asset definition financial liabilities and equity definition your difference between for equity and financial liability explained through something called as fix for fix test yesterday we have taken examples to discuss this restriction from classification as financial liability and then we went into compound financial instruments where we have seen split accounting to differentiate between liability and equity part and then there's a reclassification of equity and financial liability and then we came into the classification looking at instrument level testing and entity level testing based on that we looked at measurement the classification explained in a better format and initial recognition sometimes the transaction price is not equal to fair value what should be the treatment that we give and then we went into reclassification classification of financial liability and impairment until here we have already seen let's look at subsequently what is there subsequently we talk about recognition of financial instrument when i talk about recognizing a financial instrument there are two alternate methods of accounting which is suggested two alternate methods that means you can either adopt one method or the second the first type of accounting is called as trade date accounting the second type of accounting is called as settlement date accounting first one is called as trade date accounting second one is called as settlement date accounting what is the significant difference between both of them what is a trade date accounting and what is a settlement date accounting and how do you differentiate between these two let's take a small example and let's understand let's say for suppose on 15th of january I entered into a transaction for purchase of thousand dollars at seventy two per dollar. This is nothing but a forward contract. I am entering it on today's date. With an intention to settle it on a future date so i entered into a forward contract why i have taken a forward contract is because the trade date and settlement date of a forward contract is generally a little too far in any other case sometimes the trade date and settlement date fall on the same place so therefore there might not be any change so to explain you the difference i am basically taking a forward contract now let's say this forward contract for purchase is exercisable on 15th of april now there are two exchange three exchange rates that he gave exchange rate on 15 jan exchange rate on 31st of march balance sheet date and exchange rate on 15th of april settlement date let's say my exchange rates initially were 72 rupee per dollar but it subsequently increased to 75 per dollar on settlement date this was 73 per dollar 
have randomly taken some rates guys so these are the exchange rates existing on each of these dates let's try to record the entries if i am trying to bifurcate between a trade date accounting and settlement date account let me have both the columns trade date accounting Settlement date accounting. With the name, if I go, I understand that trade date accounting, the accounting should start on the day on which the transaction has occurred or the agreement was already made. Settlement date accounting, I will only record the transaction on the date of settlement. So let's say I'm starting it from the date of 15th of Jan, the date on which he entered into the transaction. Remember, under trade date accounting, I'll have to recognize the transaction on the date of transaction itself, which is 15th of Jan. So therefore, I will record forward asset account debit. What is forward asset here? Forward asset is nothing but my, one second guys, I think the space will not be sufficient if I keep writing like this. Forward asset is nothing but my dollar which I will receive. My, in, my entity has a right to receive dollar financial asset. I am recording it as a forward asset which is a dollar account debit to forward liability. Your forward liability is your liability to pay a rupee How much? Thousand dollars at 72 rupees. So this transaction will be entered in for 72,000. But as far as my settlement date is accounting is concerned, I am not going to record any transaction on the date of transaction. I will only record the transaction on the date of its settlement. Let's look at balance sheet date now. Because before the settlement, I got a balance sheet date, 31st March. Guys, forward contracts are derivatives. If you remember the classification, it should always be classified as FETPL because it is a derivative instrument. Derivatives have only one classification. They have to be compulsory treated as FETPL only. So the change in the fair value should be considered as uh, a change in PNL. Now look at it. The exchange rate has increased to 75. The amount which I pay for purchasing these dollars will be standard, will be 72 only. But the value of dollar which I will receive, my value of forward asset has now increased by 3 rupees. So therefore, 3000 rupees of increase in forward asset. There is no change in forward liability. I will still pay 72,000 rupees only. So record the entry. forward asset account debit which is nothing but your dollar receivable calculate how do you calculate total i had thousand dollars of receivable today the rate is 75 earlier when i recognized the transaction on transaction date or trade date it was 72 therefore i have a gain of three rupees per dollar so in total my gain is three thousand this change in fair value or increase in fair value of forward asset is a gain for me. Such gain because it is a FETPL asset classified as fair value through PNL, the value should be transferred to PNL. It is a gain which should be recognized in PNL. Then what about settlement date account? You did not recognize the forward asset or forward liability on the date of transaction. I agree. But as far as the gain is concerned on 31st March, he will definitely have to record that particular entry. So even though I'm not recording the transaction, I'm recording the entry because on 31st March, all increase or decrease in the values of assets and liabilities should be measured using FETPL. 
so this entry which was which we have already recognized under trade date accounting i am repeating it here under settlement date accounting however if you look at under trade date accounting on balance sheet date i would have represented a forward asset of 72000 plus 3000 i would have represented a forward asset of 75000 but under settlement date accounting i would have represented the forward asset at only 3000 in value clear now let's look at 15th of april that is my settlement date on the date of settlement i will receive dollar i will pay the liability first let's settle the liability first my forward liability account debit to bank how much will i pay i agreed to pay 72 rupees per dollar i will pay the same amount of 72000 but now i received the value of forward asset receive the value of forward asset now so what is the forward asset received dollar so this dollar is nothing but cash in dollars account debit what is the value of the dollar on today's date on today's day on settlement date the dollar value is 73 so therefore i received thousand dollars calculate thousand into 73 rupees which is 73000 but remember you already recognized a forward asset for 75000 now that forward asset should be cancelled to forward asset in dollars which is 75000 if you observe there is a loss in the value of dollar earlier i claimed that my forward asset is of 75000 value but when the settlement actually happened i could realize only a value of 73000 therefore i incurred a loss of 2000 this loss of 2000 should be transferred to pnl since this derivative is always fair value through pnl because your dollar fell down from 75 to 73 as on settlement date i incurred a loss of 2000 now if i come to the settlement date accounting i never recorded a forward asset i never recorded a forward liability so i'll have to directly record this transaction look at the transaction how i'll record it i received dollars cash account debit in dollars what is the value of dollars that you received 73,000 correct to bank I paid in rupees how much did you pay in rupee terms 72,000 but don't forget before you say that there is a gain of thousand don't forget you have already recognized a forward asset here which should be derecognized so derecognize the forward asset forward asset three thousand therefore the difference should be transferred to p and l because it is a loss which i will get and the loss as usual is 2000 this is what we got even under trade date accounting as well so if you look at fundamentally towards the end on the date of settlement both the entries would have a similar effect in my books of accounts there is no significant difference as far as the uh, books of accounts are concerned you will find the similar effect of both the transactions or both accountings of the transaction in your books of accounts there is no significant difference as such but the only thing that we have to remember here is this is an option given by the uh, by the standard to the enterprise to either adopt trade date accounting or settlement date accounting these two trade date and settlement date accounting would only make sense will only make sense if there is a difference between the date on which the transaction has occurred and the date on which the settlement has occurred 
if both transaction and settlement have occurred on the same day, then this transaction or this accounting will not create any significant impact. Clear? Now, sir, derivatives, I agree, sir. Three months later, the settlement date occurs. But can you tell me any other case where there is a difference between trade date and settlement date? Look at any transaction done through NSDL, National Security Depository Limited, which is the main entity for you to transact in any BSC or NSC. On your Sensex and Nifty when you are trading, any share, it is the NSDL which gives you the settlement because it is the entity which is holding your shares in a dematerialized form and will actually facilitate in transfer of shares. So remember, whenever you do a transaction through NSDL, it generally takes T plus 2 days for settlement. That means let's say for example, we have done a transaction on 1st of April, then my transaction will still be settled on T plus 2 days. That means it will only be settled on 3rd of April. This is how the different, there could be a difference between trade date and settlement date. I did not take that example because the difference between trade date and settlement date is just 2 days. In most of the situations, their transaction date itself could be a settlement date. Therefore, that is the reason why conveniently, I have taken an example where the trade date and settlement date are quite distinct from each other. Clear? That's only to help you understand what is this trade date and settlement date accounting. What is the trade date accounting? Recognize the transaction when it occurs. That means on the date of which the transaction has occurred. Settlement date, recognize the transaction when it is settled. Gain or loss should be recognized on each reporting date by marking it to market. So remember guys, even though I am adopting a settlement date, on each reporting date, I will have to mark it to market and recognize the gain or loss. What is mark to market? That means measure at what is the current market price or at the fair value. Clear? Now let's get into the concept. These are recognition. When to recognize? How to recognize? We have already seen. When we said we have to recognize it as per amortized cost or measured as per FETPL or FETOCI. All those logics are fine. Now let's get into the most important concept because this might look very simple but has to be understood with a lot of common sense. De-recognition of financial assets. What do you mean by de-recognition? De-recognition means such financial asset which is already existing in my books of accounts, it no longer exists. Or give me examples of financial assets. Bills receivable, debtors, advances how do you recognize or equity investments in infosys equity investment in reliance investment in debentures or bonds of tata steel these are all financial assets now when do you de-recognize them data when do you de-recognize when he has settled the liability or the settle the amount due i have no further right to obtain any benefit from that particular asset no further cash flows will generate from that asset. Or if it is a bill receivable, I can either collect the bill at that maturity date in such a way that I have no further right to collect any other cash flows from that particular asset. Or I could have discounted the bill with the bank. So I gave it to the banker and I said, this is your bill now. You give me how much ever you can. He deducted the amount of discount or the discount charges and he gave me the remaining. That way also the bills receivable get de-recognized uh, de or de-recognized uh, de or discharged from my books of accounts. Endorsed to creditor. I called up a creditor. I said, this fellow has given me a bill. You take this bill and you ask him the payment. I am away from this. So this is also a settlement which I have done. So therefore, I can say that I will de-recognize a debt instrument like a debtor or a bill receivable, proper debt instrument applying a CCFC test, they are debt instrument, I will de-recognize them if I have no further right to obtain any cash flows from the asset. I have no further right to obtain any cash flows from the asset or I transferred the asset. I transferred my right to receive cash to some other person. So discounting of bill with bank, endorsement of bill to creditor. I have transferred my right to receive cash flows to another party. 
along with all the significant risk and rewards of the financial asset. All significant risk and rewards of financial asset. So what did I say? I am saying I have no further right to receive cash flows. I will de-recognize the financial asset. Or that financial asset, my right to obtain cash flows has been transferred to a third party. And along with the transfer of the financial asset, I also transferred all risk and rewards incidental to that financial asset. So tomorrow if there is a default, then don't come to me. I have already transferred all my risk and rewards. What about equity instrument? In an equity instrument, there should be a transfer of the equity instrument along with a risk and rewards on the financial instrument. So I transfer the share along with all the risk and rewards of the instrument. In such cases, I will say that it is a transfer of an equity instrument where it should be de-recognized or the holder of the instrument is no longer having a right to obtain cash flows even upon liquidation of the enterprise. Let the company liquidate also. You have no right to receive cash flows. In such cases, I will de-recognize the financial asset. Clear? Now, I want to concentrate, but I want to help you with an example. I'm dealing with de-recognition. I want to help you with an example out here. Let me tell you frankly, the de-recognition is not as simple as it looks. Especially when I bring up the concept of bills received. Whenever I receive a bill, I record the entry as bills receivable account debit. to data generally this is the entry which i receive a record because i received the bill from the data this bill has significantly three ways of being used the first way of using this bill is to hold it till maturity where I will only receive the proceeds or cash flows from the bill and therefore there is no entry necessary to be recognized. But sometimes there could be a discounting with bank. Whenever I discount a bill with a bank, then I will recognize the entry as bank account debit Remember, fundamental service, discount account debit or discount charges account debit to bills receivable. I hope everyone remembers this entry. The third way is to endorse to a creditor. When I endorse the bill to a creditor, then in such situation, I will record the entry as creditor account debit to bills receivable. Now, if you look at fundamentally these two situations where I am de-recognizing the bill, I want to further concentrate and discuss only about this aspect where I am de-recognizing the bill under discount to a bank and endorse to a creditor. Only these two I am talking about because I credited the bills receivable. When I credited bills receivable, that means I am de-recognizing the bill. In either of these situations, if the bill is honored, if the bill is honored, then there is no problem. I have no issue if the bill is actually honored. My issue arises when the bill is dishonored. My issue arises when the bill is dishonored. So what happens if a bill is dishonored? If the bill is dishonored, 
then the banker will take the entire money from you. So therefore, again, I will have to record the entry as no, no reverse entry. Instead of bills receivable, bill is already gone. It is dishonored. So I will bring back the debtor, debtor account debit to bank because the banker has taken from my bank account the entire money of the bill. Sometimes he takes additional money also because of notary charges. Similarly, in the creditor situation, if bill is dishonored, even if it is endorsed to a creditor and the bill is dishonored, in such situation also, I'll have to record the entry as debtor account debit to creditor. I am bringing back the receivable. I am also bringing back the payable into my books of accounts. Now my question is, when these entries were recorded, when you discounted the bill with the bank or endorsed to a creditor, you derecognized the bill. You credited the bills receivable. But if you remember just now what we have discussed in the presentation, what was the discussion that we had? If I have to derecognize a bill, then I should transfer my right to receive cash flow. Yes, when the bill is discounted to the bank, then my right to receive ca derived cash flow from the bills receivable, I have transferred it to the bank. If I endorsed it to a creditor, my right to receive cash flow has been transferred to the creditor. But have I transferred risk and rewards? Absolutely no. The risk of dishonor or the risk of default in payment is still lying with my is still lying with me that means it is still lying with the enterprise therefore in both these situations you cannot you cannot cancel the bill receivable so therefore let me tell you what we have to do in both these situations where you credited the bill receivable the credit should not be to bills receivable your crediting bills receivable is not appropriate since bill should not be derecognized. Why it should not be derecognized? Because the liability of default is still on the company. liability or risk of dishonor default or dishonor is not transferred is not transferred to either the bank or the creditor Therefore, it is not appropriate for us to derecognize the bill. Clear? So, either in this case where I wrote bank where it is discounted as bank or in this case where it is endorsed to creditor, both cases this statement will hold good that the bill should not be recognized. The risk of default or dishonor is not transferred to the banker or creditor. Then what is the entry that I will record? Instead of writing this entry as credit to bills receivable, I'll record the entry like this. Bank account debit. Discount charges account debit. To liability for bills discounted. My liability comes in only if the party has defaulted in payment. Same way, under endorsed to creditor, I'll record the entry as creditor account debit to liability for bill endorsed. It is liability for bill endorsed. What do you mean by this? That means I am not derecognizing the bill. 
if i look at the balance sheet immediately after this entry in the balance sheet on the asset side i will still find the item of bills receivable and on the liability side i will find the item of liability for bills both the amount should be for the same price there is no difference in the amounts but both these items should appear just because both are appearing doesn't mean that i cancel off bills receivable and liability for bill clear why why can't you set off these items offsetting a financial asset and financial liability can only be possible if such an offset is legally permissible and the entity expects to set off or offset and settle the transaction on net basis here can you settle the transaction on net basis your liability will or bill will appear only if your bills receivable is not collected if your bill is not collected then only your liability arises if the bill is already paid there's no liability at all so therefore it is not appropriate for us to basically uh, present these items as net amounts they cannot be set off or offset because the enterprise does not intend to settle this on net basis clear the same thing i'll represent it in the better form we call this as discounting of bills with records and without records what is this with records without records let's see whenever i discount a bill there are two types of discounting one is with records the other one is without records what is with records when i say with records that means the risk of default in the bill is still with the enterprise you have when if there is a default of the bill or a dishonor of the bill then it will be the entity's responsibility to pay it to the banker or to the creditor but when i say when there is without records that means i have transferred the risk and rewards of the uh, bill receivable directly to the other party in such cases i can de recognize it because i did not just transfer the right to receive cash flow but i also transferred along with that the risk and rewards which are attached to that particular bill clear so with records i transferred the rewards on the bill not the risk without records i transferred the bill the risk the rewards everything transferred de recognize with records if there is a dishonor he will come back to me i will not i will not de recognize the bill clear Now, any doubts till now on recognition and de-recognition?